you can now support Ghost Maps on Patreon. Simply look for We Are Huntu or click the link in the description. Ghost Maps. As we dismount Alice's bike and undo the straps of our helmets, she tells me that this stretch of road was quieter in the 80s. She adds wistfully that a lot of things were quieter back then. I've known Alice for a number of years. She does what I do, in a sense, keeping track of things and history of this country. Her focus, however, has always been specifically on roads and streets. That's why, instead of meeting her interviewees at a coffee shop like I do, she brings them out to the locations themselves on her bike. It's different for roads, she tells me. She likens roads to the veins of the country. They're transient by their very nature. She explains that that's why it's good for the interviewee to be in the place itself. It grounds them in the experience. I nod and tell her that I see her point. Then we continue walking down the road. It's the middle of the afternoon and we are at the start of Mount Pleasant Road. Alice wanted to tell me about one of her own personal experiences, but she wanted to do it her way. She tells me that it's a short ride from here to the Singapore Polo Club, but that short ride is where it all happened. I tell her to start from the beginning. It was 1986, and Alice was riding through this area with May, a girlfriend of hers. It was about seven in the evening, and the pair were headed back to May's place in Thompson. Alice herself had taken this route many times prior, though she adds that those other rides were during the day. She admits that it might have been possible that she had missed little details before, but she knew the route itself pretty well. Which was why she found it strange that as she approached the turning towards Mount Pleasant Drive, there was a gate on her left. She had never seen that gate before. Beyond it was a dirt path that wound around several tall trees. Atop each pillar of the gate was ceramic birds that were covered in a thick layer of moss. The moment Alice's bike passed by the gates, its engine began sputtering and shut down entirely. The pair got off the bike, and Alice began inspecting the engine to see what the problem was. Light was fading, and the canopy of the surrounding trees only made it harder to get a good look without a flashlight. After about half a minute of inspecting the engine and the bike, Alice was still unable to find anything wrong. That's what May said. Maybe they can help. Alice stood up, looked in the direction where May was pointing, and felt her blood run cold. May would later describe what she saw it was a nice elderly couple. The man wore old man khakis and a buttock shirt. 
the woman was dressed in a traditional kabaya. The man, me would say, was waving them over, almost as if to offer them help. What Alice saw was something else entirely. Help me push the bike, me, Alice said. She had hoped she had said it with enough urgency, but without panicking me. May, however, seemed entranced. She kept telling Alice that the nice man looked like he wanted to help. Finally, Alice yelled at me. Push the damn bike right now. May shook her head, almost as if to dust the cobwebs out of her mind. And she grabbed one of the handles and helped Alice push the bike in the direction of the polo club. After just a few meters, Alice tried the bike again and it came to life almost immediately. The pair looked back and May could still see the old man waving at her. But the elderly couple looked different at this distance. It looked almost as if they were shimmering, like the further Alice and me got from them, the harder it was for the couple to keep up their facade. Alice told me to get on the bike and they rode down past the polo club and onto Thompson, where the road was a bit more crowded. I asked Alice what she saw. She paused a moment before answering. She points out first that Bucket Brown Cemetery was nearby, to the right of us, just beyond the road. Then she adds, that what she saw wasn't a spirit. She tells me that she saw two young girls, both dressed in identical kabayas. Their hair was covering their faces. They knew that Alice knew that it was just a disguise. She says that's why their facade barely held up. She saw just one pair of red eyes glaring beyond the girls. And she could have sworn that she heard a snarl. Alice pauses again, then shudders next to me, despite the warm afternoon sun beating down on us. I've had experiences before that, unexplained things and weird sensations, but nothing so direct, Alice says. She adds that that's the moment she knew she had to do what we do. She shrugs, then asks me in a lighter tone, what was the moment that I knew, the one experience that I had that made me what I am today? I tell her, that's a story for another time, and I'll tell it to her on my terms. She smiles, punches me in the arm, and says that we should head back to the bike. I smile back and follow her as she walks back the way we came. Aiden hops to his feet to greet me and shake my hand when I arrive at the coffee shop near the Angmokyo interchange. He tells me that he's really been looking forward to our meeting, but before I can respond, he's already excitedly ruffling through his backpack. Onto the green, slightly damp coffee shop table, he messily stacks files, folders, and stray bits of crumpled A4 paper. He talks at length about how he's been studying the supernatural too, and wants to share with me all the information he's gathered up. 
I managed to calm him down by telling him that maybe we could talk about all of this another time and just to stick to what he's experienced personally for now. He nods, only slightly deflated by my suggestion. When the drink stall auntie comes by our table, I order myself a copio, and Aiden asks for the same. Quickly, I interject and suggest that maybe a soothing lemon barley might be what he needs right now instead, to help him focus on telling his story as best as he can, of course. He agrees, and changes his order. I ask Aiden where this enthusiasm for the supernatural came from, and he says that it actually only started after his own experience. Ah, I think to myself, with a slight smile, I've noticed over the years that there's a certain group of people who tend to jump into the supernatural rather eagerly after their first brush with the beyond. Eden is clearly one of those people. It's certainly not the worst response to an otherwise traumatic incident, so I try not to discourage it, but it also means that I'll need to tread a little more cautiously when it comes to coaxing his story out of him. Eden's barley arrives just as I take out my recorder and ask him to slowly start from the beginning. Devon and Pete didn't want to come out, but Aiden kept insisting. The last time that they were all in Singapore together had been around two years ago. So Aiden felt that the three childhood friends were long overdue for a reunion. Devon and Pete were hesitant because unlike Aiden, neither of them were entirely comfortable with being out too late during the Hungry Ghost Month. After constantly badgering them about meeting up though, Aiden's friends eventually relented, but only on two conditions. They'd meet near Devon and Pete's home in Tampines, and it would just be for a quick cup of coffee. We won't leave any later than 8pm, Aiden promised. When they finally saw each other that evening though, the three friends were immediately swept up by a comforting sense of familiarity. They joked and laughed as if no time had passed at all since they were last together. They reminisced, but also updated each other on where each of them were in their lives and where they hoped to be next. Before any of them knew it, it was well past 10pm. Pete and Devon seemed uneasy when they realised how late it was, but not as nervous as they expected to be. Aiden proposed that they cut across a nearby park, which would take them straight to Pete's flat. From there, it was just another couple of minutes to Devon's place, after which Aiden would hop into a cab back to Ang Mo Kyo. Devon and Pete agreed, and they all hurried along. Unsurprisingly, the park was pretty quiet at that hour. There were still a few people around though, a couple cozying up on a bench, a kid walking her dog, and an old man going for a late night stroll. Aiden, Devon and Pete continued chatting but Aiden could sense that his friends were getting a little tense. So he quickened the pace, and without a word, Devon and Pete kept up. They started to look a bit more relieved, especially with the main road now just in sight, about 200 meters away. But then Pete suddenly stopped in his tracks. Aiden tells me, in a tone it's definitely more somber than before. That when they were younger, Pete had confided in them that he had the ability to see beyond the ordinary. The third eye, he called it. 
Aiden at the time, hadn't believed him, but kept his skepticism to himself. Staring blankly into the distance, he says, I honestly still didn't believe him, even right up to that moment. He pauses for a moment, then adds, but then I saw it. Pete was glaring at a particularly large, dark and deep storm drain. Even under the slightly dim lights that lined the footpath they were on, Aiden could see that Pete had gone completely pale. Aiden asked what was going on, but Pete didn't answer. Devon followed Pete's line of sight, and whatever it was that had Pete so spooked, Aiden could tell from the expression on Devon's face that he clearly saw it too. Pete's eyes still locked on the storm drain. He hissed under his breath, just keep moving. Devon and Pete carefully continued down the path towards the brighter lights of the main road. Aiden, however, kept staring at the drain, determined to see what it was that had frightened his friends. It didn't take long for that determination to pay off. It seemed vaguely human at first, and Aiden's first thought was that it might have been a homeless person. He called out to it and asked if it needed any help. Suddenly, it turns its attention towards Aiden. It moved slowly at first, in a strange manner, almost as if all the bones in its body were broken. Aiden was about to step forward to help it, but then it walked into the light. Its body was wrinkled and leathery. The flesh was split all over as if it had been cut and scratched over and over. And it was missing its head. Somehow, it seemed to be making some kind of noise, like the chittering of insects. Aiden couldn't move. Fear held him still, but also the shocking realization of just how wrong he had been all his life, and how much the arrogance was about to cost him. The creature seemed pleased by this, and made its way towards him, quicker than before. That's when Aiden felt someone grab his arm. He turned to see Pete pulling him. Run, his friend said. The pair sprinted out of the park and never once looked back to see if they were being followed. Aiden tells me that he was ill for three days after. A slight fever only, but a constant feeling of nausea as well, as if the fear he felt that night had taken root in his gut. His doctor couldn't figure out what was wrong with him, but his uncle knew a Bomo, a witch doctor, who could help. It took Aiden about five days to fully recover. Devon and Pete visited him every day. Aiden slowly keeps his files, folders, and scattered sheets of paper back into his backpack. Finally, I can completely see the unease that was hidden under all that enthusiasm. Thankfully, it's not a crippling anxiety. There's a stubbornness in Aiden's eyes, one that says that now that he's been proven wrong, he'll never get caught off guard again. He chuckles and tells me that if there was one good thing that came out of that night, it's that him, Pete, and Devon are now closer than ever. I smile, then wave the drink store auntie over. I may have gotten the story I was looking for, but I suspect 
that what Aiden needs right now is another listening ear. I order for us two more copios, and we continue talking well past 10 p.m. I notice David's tattoo as soon as he takes a seat across from me. We're at a coffee shop in Sengkang, a couple of blocks away from his flat, on a nice, sunny Saturday afternoon. David doesn't seem to think much of the weather, though. I suppose it's just rose-tinted glasses, he says, with a shrug. The skies are never as clear as they used to be when you are a kid. David admits that his teenage years were probably no more special than most Singaporean kids back in the late 90s. Shopping for clothes at Far East Plaza, buying CDs at the old Tower Records, trying to sneak into clubs, and of course, school holidays spent at Shelley's. He laughs at how no one does that anymore. I don't want to sound like one of those old guys that goes on and on about what he used to do back in his day, though. He chuckles. I take the opportunity to ask about the tattoo on his right forearm. It's of a mahjong tile, one of those on which a Chinese character has been engraved. I recognize the character as Dong or East. He tells me that it's actually connected to his story. Which, of course, is my cue to turn on my recorder and ask him to start from the beginning. It was the December holidays back in 1998, and David and his friends were on the cusp of young adulthood. They'd all received their O-level results just a week earlier. Most of them would be furthering their education locally. Some of them had opportunities to study abroad. A couple of them were even planning to jump straight into work. All of them, however, knew that this school holiday was probably going to be one of their last times hanging out together, even if none of them wanted to say it out loud. So, they decided to mark the occasion by booking a chalet over at East Coast Park. There were ten of them at the chalet, including David's two best friends, Hadi and Joe, as well as his girlfriend at the time, Melissa. They had booked the chalet for five days, the first two of which were relatively uneventful. Most meals were lightly charred fare, like chicken, satay or prawns, eaten off paper plates around the barbecue. Music was constantly playing, either from David's radio courtesy of someone strumming an off-key cover of Wonderwall on Joe's guitar. And there was always a game of Mahjong going on. On the third night, David, Melissa, and two of their other friends, Samantha and Aaron, were in the middle of one of those games. It was around one in the morning, and no one had gone to bed yet. Hadin, Joe and the rest of their friends were just chatting, mostly about their idealistic plans for the future. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, until the chalet suddenly went cold. Not the kind of cold from a particularly chilly breeze or an air conditioner set too low, but almost like an overwhelming presence. Hadi was the first to notice, and tried to adjust the fans, but it didn't seem to make a difference. That's when David realized that something was wrong with Melissa. She had stopped speaking mid-sentence, and had gone completely pale. She tilted her head down, and started mumbling to herself in what sounded like two different voices. David couldn't make out what she was saying. Suddenly, her head shot back up, and something about her had completely changed, as if the lighting on her was all wrong. Her skin was 
sickly green and her eyes didn't seem to focus. And then she spoke. It was a voice that David didn't recognize, but swears to me that he'll never forget. It was still a woman, but she sounded older, much older. There was a hoarseness to her voice that simply couldn't have come from his usually soft-spoken girlfriend. She growled out a hello that got everyone's attention and stunned them into complete silence. Everyone, that is, except for Joe, who calmly but firmly asked this woman who she was and what she wanted. David would later find out that this wasn't Joe's first brush with the supernatural. But in that moment, David was in complete awe at his friend's bravery. The spirit, it seemed, was impressed too. In something almost approximating a friendly tone, she said, wearing an unsettling grin on Melissa's face, that she wanted to play Mahjong. Joe told her that she had possessed their friend, and again, as politely as he could, that she was not welcome there. The spirit, however, simply replied, Then make me leave. Joe didn't respond to her. Instead, he looked pleadingly around the chalet. Samantha and Aaron had already stepped away from the table. But if the spirit wanted to play, then it needed people to play with. David followed Joe's line of sight and saw what his friend did, that despite having their futures ahead of them, in that very moment, the reality was that they were all still children. Terrified children. Eventually, Hari stood up and together with Joe, joined David at the mahjong table. David tells me that if the spirit had possessed anyone besides Melissa, he probably would have stepped away from the table too. I wasn't brave, he says, but I felt less scared with Hadi and Joe there. With her fellow players finally seated, the spirit reached out to the tiles in the center of the table. Before she started shuffling them though, she said plainly, flashing that unsettling, ill-fitting grin again, that she didn't like to lose. The boys only nodded, as the sound of shuffled plastic tiles and hoarse laughter filled the chalet. They played for hours. Everyone who wasn't part of the game barely moved all night. One of the boys even wet himself. But still no one dared to make a sound. By 6.30, the spirit's side of the table was piled high with chips, which she looked upon proudly. It was around this time when the spirit suddenly let out a satisfied grunt, a voice more guttural than before, and then laid her head on the table. David, Joe, and Hadi were unsure of what was going on at first, but then David noticed that the chalet's fluorescent lights were now mixed with the warm rays of the sun shining through the windows. There was dawn. The spirit had left. Melissa rubbed the sleep from her eyes and asked what had happened. That morning, with two days remaining on their booking, the ten friends packed up and left. For years after, I never went back to that area, David says. He knew that the whole stretch had been revamped in the early 2000s, 
and that all those familiar Shelleys were gone. When he finally decided to check out the area again a few years ago, it was a jarring experience for him. Certainly, though not entirely for the reasons he had expected. Standing there, watching as a whole new generation of teenagers wild away their holidays, hopeful for the future that awaited them. He found himself filled with a mix of disorientation, that same sense of relief he had felt when that night came to an end, and a strange longing, a longing for when the skies always seemed clearer to him, a longing for barbecues and bad acoustic wonderwall covers. And that's when I finally realize what David's tattoo means. It wasn't a reminder of his encounter. It was a reminder of his life before it. Nazri, my second interviewee on this Hungry Ghost Month evening, arrives just as my first interviewee, Gary, is leaving. They exchange some pleasantries, but don't really say much else to each other, since Gary has to head home to his family. If they did speak for a while longer, however, they'd realize they have a fair bit in common. Like Gary, Nazri's here to share a couple of encounters he had during this time of the year, when the barriers between our world and that of the supernatural are at their thinnest. And just like Gary, Nazri's encounters happened during his basic military training on Pulautakong. No matter how many ghost stories you hear about the island, some part of you just hopes that they're all nonsense, Nazri says, as he orders himself a teo at this Badok coffee shop. Or, even if they are true, you at least hope that it never happens to you. Nazri is a lecturer at an arts school these days. One of his students, Adam, was a former interviewee of mine and has followed me on a couple of other interviews. Adam actually asked if he could join us tonight, but Nazri requested that he not be here. I've mentioned to the class before, in passing, that I've got some army ghost stories, Nazri tells me. But it's one thing to casually talk about these experiences with my students, and a whole other thing to cross the line and have him hear the entire story. I personally know that Adam's made of sterner stuff, but I keep this to myself. Instead, I shift the conversation back to Nazri's experiences. Two of them, to be precise. You hope that it never happens to you. And then it happens one after another, Nazri says with a laugh. With a smirk, I tell him that I understand how that can feel like. He laughs again, though he looks slightly embarrassed. I give him a reassuring smile. And as Nazri's Teo arrives, I switch my recorder back on and ask him to start from the beginning. It was 2007. Nazri and his fellow recruits were outfield in the jungles of Takong, away from the comparative familiarity of their bunks. Even though this was during the Hungry Ghost Month, the recruits weren't given any special instructions by either their sergeants or their warrant officers. No warnings about being extra cautious, about apologizing to any spirits that might be around before relieving themselves 
while in nature, or about showing the proper respect to any statues or joysticks or offerings that they might come across in the jungles. Minazri says that he knew, even then, that this was not the norm, that his superiors were being lackadaisical in their duties. But at the time, he wasn't going to question the same people who could dish out punishment if he seemed too insubordinate. So, together with the rest of his platoon, he went outfield, armed with the right equipment, but without the proper knowledge. Those first two days, however, went by uneventfully. Digging shell scrapes, heating up their less than appetizing looking rations, holding onto their rifles for dear life so that they didn't get yelled at by their sergeants, and really strengthening the bonds between each other. It was grueling for the recruits, but it was mostly nothing out of the ordinary. Mostly. During those first two nights, some of us could have sworn we heard someone laughing out in the jungle, Nazri tells me. We chalked it up to just some overactive imaginations. We all knew how flimsy that reasoning was. On the third evening, though, things changed. For one thing, it was unnaturally colder. The winds whipped at them violently, blowing over equipment and sending recruits huddling together for some sense of security. It was almost like the cold was attacking them. I mean, come on, on Tekong? Hell, anywhere in Singapore? No way that's normal, Nazri says. The chill, however, was only a precursor to what was to come. At around 8pm, Nazri was placed in charge of leading the men to the area where they'd dig up their latrines. Glamorous work, he says, with a humorless chuckle. Five of his platoon mates found quiet corners to attend to their business. None of them apologized or asked for permission. In retrospect, Nazri felt like this was the final straw. Whatever was in that jungle, it was being reasonable up to that point, he says, a far away look coming over him. It had given us two nights to show it some respect. Standing in a clearing, rubbing his arms as the weather seemed to grow colder, almost like the chill was closing in on him, Nazri suddenly saw a flash of white moving against the darkness of the surrounding trees. He didn't want to get a closer look, but he knew he had to. If he didn't, whatever was out there would only feel more slighted. So he flashed his torchlight's beam into the darkness of the jungle. It felt like the light almost moved, in slow motion illuminating the oppressive gloom of his surroundings inch by inch instead of all at once. Nazri knows that can't be true, but it suddenly felt that way at the time, he tells me. Soon, the light revealed what was waiting for him. Out there, amidst the trees and the darkness, was an elderly man 
in traditional attire, grinning. It certainly wasn't a pleasant expression, but it wasn't even maliciously playful either. Somehow his lips stretched from ear to ear, his yellowed crooked teeth bared. And behind all of that was anger. I wanted to run, Nazri tells me. But I, I couldn't. I don't know if it was fear or something else, but I was frozen there. To make matters worse, the man started moving towards Nazri. He can't recall precisely how he moved, though. Sometimes I remember him just walking slowly, he says. Other times he was crawling like, like a spider. Sometimes he was floating and sometimes somehow it was all three. However, the man made his way towards him. Nazri definitely remembers what he did next. He prayed. He kept his eyes open the whole time, unblinkingly watching the man as he came closer and closer. Nazri couldn't bring himself to meet his gaze directly. Instead, he just stared at that hungry grin. And he kept praying. And after what felt like far too long, Nazri couldn't keep his eyes open. He blinked. And when he opened his eyes again, the man was gone. Finally, regaining control of his senses, Nazri yelled for the other recruits to finish up whatever they were doing. And together, they all quickly made their way back to where the rest of the platoon were. Nazri tried telling his sergeant what had happened. But his superior just waved him off and even yelled at him for taking too long. I just took the scolding, he tells me. Honestly, after what I faced in the jungle, an angry sergeant was nothing. But then he sighs and adds, I just wish it was the last thing I had to deal with that night. Exhausted from his ordeal, it didn't take long for Nazri to fall asleep in his shell scrape, even knowing what was out there. He figured that if the man really wanted to do something horrible to him, he would have done it already. And he did leave Nazri alone for the rest of the night, except to give him a warning. Around four in the morning, Nazri woke up to the sound of something moving and the shell scrape in front of him. I only remembered later that this was the demo shell scrape that our sergeant had dug. He says, no one should have been in there. Groggily, Nazri opened his eyes and thought for a second that he saw a soldier standing in the shell scrape. He didn't recognize this soldier, but he was also not entirely awake yet, so he didn't think much of it at the time. Still, he knew immediately that there were a couple of things wrong. For one, the soldier was dressed in the old Tamasic green uniform from the 60s. 
another thing that stood out was that he had his rifle out and aimed at Nazri's buddy Vivek. Nazri blinked, hoping to clear out the blariness, but where the soldier was a second ago, the elderly man stood instead. The man was not looking at him, though. Nazri was at least thankful for that. But, like the soldier before, the man was staring directly at Vivek, he tells me. Nazri blinked again. This time, the shell scrape was empty. I was ready to call it a nightmare, he says. I mean, it all happened in that state between sleep and consciousness. But then, when we returned to our bunks a few days later, Nazri shivers. He apologizes and says he needs another drink before he continues. I tell him it's absolutely fine and turn to call the drink stall auntie over but then stop before I can wave to get her attention. Standing at the stall is a soldier. Not an NS man who's just come back from camp, but a soldier in a Tamasic green uniform. I guess Bart. No. A little too loudly. And Nasri asks if I'm okay. I quickly turn back to him to reassure him. To tell him I'm fine. And that there's nothing, nothing at all, to worry about. But when I turn back, the soldier's gone. I pause for a moment. This isn't the first incident since my accident. I thought I might have just been tired. But this is clearly more than burnout. Something's going on. And I decide that I need to explore this to figure out what's happening. But... After tonight, after I finished these Hungry Ghost Month interviews, I wave to the drink stall auntie, then turn back and as best as I can keep up my brave front for Nasri. John is not my interviewee's real name. Using an alias was actually his one condition for meeting me this evening at a coffee shop in Tanjung Paga. He explains that this was important to him because of when and where his story is set. The old Hill Street Police Station has served several purposes since it opened its doors in 1934. John worked there in the early 2000s, around the time it first assumed its role as the headquarters for a government ministry. He left more than a decade ago though, and has since had stints at privately owned events companies instead. Right from the start though, I knew this line of work was what I wanted to do. He tells me. Events can be, and usually are, chaotic. I enjoy bringing enough order to make that chaos fun. He adds, with a smile. But as much as he loves this industry on a whole, John's own sense of purpose wasn't always as clear. When he had first joined the ministry, the greater cultural mindset was very old-fashioned. 
It wasn't just in his workplace. Everyone he knew understood that you worked long hours not out of the love for what you do, but because that was what was expected of you. You stayed in late or went to the office on weekends. Because if you didn't, everyone else would treat you like you were slacking off, he says. And when you're starting out, that can make things really tough for you. He knows this way of thinking is still very much the norm among a lot of people today. But he's glad to see it's changing slowly, especially among the younger crowd. That said, however, it was this need to work at ungodly hours that resulted in John's incident. As our drinks arrive, copy for me, a teo for him, I switch my recorder on and ask him to start from the beginning. John had heard stories about the building from the day he joined. Lots of insinuation and second-hand accounts from colleagues about sightings and encounters. He was told that even though precautions were taken to keep the building safe from the supernatural, it was still prone to the unexplained. John, however, mostly took all of these with a grain of salt. The office culture equivalent of hazing the new kid, he figured. And still, he couldn't help but feel the weight of working in a building that had been around for as long as it had. No matter what the sign outside says though, or how fresh its coat of paint is, an old building will always carry with it its um, history, John says, solemnly. His office's long, narrow corridors certainly didn't help, particularly late at night and on weekends, when he was sometimes one of the very few people in the building. Most of us were seated in cubicles with tall partitions, so as you walked down the corridors, you really couldn't tell if there was anyone else there, he explains. It wasn't scary per se, but just very creepy, if that makes any sense. It was this sense of creepiness that filled him as he drove into his office's car park at midnight on one particular Saturday. I had just finished watching a movie with a couple of friends, John tells me. And I had an event early the next day, so I went in to check my emails, in case there were any last-minute changes. This was the early 2000s after all, it's not like I could read my emails off my phone, he adds with a chuckle. Up till this point, John had only worked late on weeknights and had never been the last person to leave the office. So, the emptiness of the building seemed almost imposing. He knew there were security guards stationed elsewhere on the grounds, which gave him some comfort, but not enough to make him feel like he was welcome in the building at that hour. John took the lift from the car park up to his level. Once he stepped out of the lift, he turned left towards his workstation. Thankfully, his seat wasn't all the way at the end of that long, narrow corridor, but about a third of the way. Nevertheless, he made a conscious effort 
not to look at any of the other cubicles, worried that his mind would play tricks on him. Or worse, that he might actually see something. When he reached his cubicle, John switched his radio on and blasted it louder than he normally would. He then switched his PC on and as he normally did every day, he headed to the restroom while the computer booted up. I can't remember what was playing on the radio, but it was a catchy pop song, John recalls. It helped me calm down a little more, so I sang along to it loudly on the way to the toilets. The entrances to both restrooms were situated behind a door. As the door shut behind John, he noted that he could no longer hear the radio. He didn't think much of it at the time. After all, his cubicle was a bit of a distance away, and it's not like he would have noticed how soundproof this door was at any other time. He finished up and headed back out, only to discover that the office was completely silent. No music echoing down the corridor anymore. I could feel the fear rising in me, but I tried to reason it all out, he says. Maybe the radio's battery died, he thought to himself. Returning to his cubicle, however, he learned that it wasn't as simple as that. The radio had been switched off. John switched it back on and sure enough, it worked fine. So maybe there was someone else in the office. He took a moment to psych himself up, then stood up and for the first time that night, looked around at the other cubicles. No one. No glow from any other computers not even any sound of movement. My options for a logical explanation were disappearing pretty quickly, he says, with another chuckle, though this one's clearly tinged with unease. John admits that he probably should have left at this point, but slightly sheepishly, he says that he couldn't bring himself to leave without at least checking his emails first. So he tried calling out to see if there was someone else in the office who happened to be working really, really quietly. Anyone out there? He yelled, his voice more strained than he hoped. No response. The silence was starting to make him feel oddly claustrophobic, like it had him trapped. And as he skimmed through his emails, he gave the security guards a call to ask if anyone had come by and switched off his radio. They sounded confused and just a little worried. No one had come up to his floor at all. Keeping his voice as steady as he could, he thanked them, hung up the phone, and shut his computer down. He then switched his radio back off and made his way to the lift. But just as the lift door opened, however, he heard the click of his radio being switched on. Instead of music, it was tuned 
to static. Static echoed down the long corridor. Static that screamed at him. In that noise, he could have sworn he heard a voice. No, not a voice, but a discordant collection of voices in different languages. They all growled the same thing. Lee. I didn't even head for the car park, just because I didn't want to be alone any longer than I needed to be, John tells me. Instead, he jogged over to Clark Key, where he hailed a cab to take him back home. Oddly enough, he found that he wasn't gripped by that same terror the next day at his event. He told a couple of colleagues what had happened and received either one of two responses. Some of them looked deeply affected, swearing to never work late again no matter what. Others were almost desperate to brush it off and reason it away. I still keep in contact with lots of the people who were affected by the story, he says, with a smile that speaks volumes. John tells me that the reason his fear dissipated overnight seemed obvious to him immediately. Those voices weren't a warning, he says. At least, not totally. He thinks that while the spirits certainly wanted the building to themselves at that hour, they also were expressing concern for him. He realizes that he's probably projecting his own feelings onto the situation. Feelings he was already harboring at the time. But I'm happier now, he says. So... Really, what difference does it make? I smile and tell him that I can't and honestly won't argue with that logic. My last three interviewees for this Hungry Ghost Month evening are Rob, Liz and her husband, Asho. The trio have been inseparable since college when Liz and Ashok met while studying in Australia. We ran in different circles before college, Liz says. Ashok, however, adds with a grin, what she's very kindly not saying is that she was the popular party girl and I was the bookworm. Liz gives Ashok a playful wink, then says, and yet, for some reason, I always got better grades than you. Rob laughs boisterously at this, earning him glares from this Ubi coffee shop's other patrons. I'll never understand what she saw in him. I'm just glad she saw something, Rob says, slapping Ashok on the back. Rob was a Sydney native and Ashok's college roommate. When Ashok moved back to Singapore, Rob thought a change of scenery would be nice and looked for work here too. This was seven years ago. These days, Liz admits that they don't see each other as often as they used to. She says, Matter-of-factly, I work at SGH, Ashok works in Science Park, and this clown's in the CBD. It's not like we can do regular lunch dates. Still, she says that whenever Ashok and her do meet up with Rob, 
it's like the old days all over again. Just with less partying, she laughs. Rob says that it was during these old days when their story takes place. It's a long one, but if you guys don't mind, I'd like to talk about what happened that first night. Rob says, his loud, jovial disposition quieting down a little. Ashok and Liz nod, so I turn my recorder towards Rob and ask him to start from the beginning. Back in 2015, Liz, Ashok and Rob, together with three other friends, took a road trip up to Port Dixon in Malaysia for a short getaway. Their friend, Vincent, had booked a four-story villa in a gated community for the group. The villa included spacious individual rooms for Rob and Vincent, a bedroom just for Ashok and Liz, and another for the other couple, Sheila and Mike. All that plus a barbecue pit, a pool, and a jacuzzi. It sounded like a dream, Rob tells me. But since we weren't a particularly religious bunch, none of us noticed that our holiday fell during the last weekend of the Hungry Ghost Month. Things at least started out great though. The roughly five and a half hour drive in the rented minivan began at about noon and spirits were high all the way there. Everyone joked and laughed and good-naturedly argued about the playlist. As the evening neared, the group looked forward to seeing their villa in person. Upon turning into the gated community, however, their mood took a dip. The villa itself was gorgeous, looking less like a cliched holiday destination and more like a mansion bathed in the setting sun's orange glow. The villas that surrounded it likewise sported equally lavish exteriors. But what cast a shadow over the group, though, was that all these surrounding villas were unoccupied. No one said anything, but everyone seemingly came to the same conclusion. Something wasn't right. After a while, Vincent tried to lift their spirits back up. Hey, he said, the cheeriness in his voice clearly exaggerated. At least we can make as much noise as we want. Everyone chuckled awkwardly and at least attempted to shake off that sense of dread. We faked it till we made it, Rob says, shrugging. As the group settled in, things did genuinely start to brighten up. Wowed by the size of their accommodation and its amenities, the apprehension took a back seat to camaraderie as everyone did their part to prepare their food for the barbecue pit. Satay and chicken wings, ota and truffle corn. It was a relative feast for the friends. The flames from the pit illuminated their front yard and despite the neighbouring villas still standing ominously empty, the group at least took comfort and the warmth of the fire's light. With the food ready, everyone adjourned into the villa to dig in. Everyone except Vincent, who chose to stay outside and cook up some luncheon meat that he had brought along. Something about this didn't sit right with Rob, though. That 
unease that he had felt earlier, as they entered the gated community, returned. While just minutes ago, the fire provided comfort, now seemed to cast looming shadows on all the other villas. Rob tried to coax Vincent into staying with the group instead, but Vincent just waved him off. I was contemplating whether I should join him, Rob says just the slightest hint of regret weighing down his tone. At least, he wouldn't be alone, right? But I just couldn't bring myself to stay out there any longer. About 20 minutes later, Vincent came strolling back in, looking pleased. He'd cooked prepared and finished a luncheon meat sandwich and was now happily helping himself to some chicken wings. Seeing as his friend was no worse for wear, Rob relaxed a little. The evening carried on without incident for a while. But as time passed, Rob noticed that Vincent started to look tired. Dark rings formed around his eyes and his normally healthy brown skin took on a sickly green shade. Just before midnight, Vincent quietly excused himself and said he wanted to head to bed. The rest of the group jokingly chided him. But Vincent snapped back at them with a string of profanities. Liz, Ashok and Rob all agree that they'd never seen him like that before. There was a viciousness to his tone, Rob says, shuddering at the memory. And as Vincent stormed up to his room, the rest of the group expressed their concern. A couple of minutes later, it was decided that Rob should go check on him, since the two of them were pretty close. Making his way cautiously towards Vincent's room on the second floor, Rob was once again gripped by that same feeling from earlier. That sense that something was wrong. He was about to knock on Vincent's door when he heard his friend loudly retching from inside. Rob tried the door, but it was locked. He started knocking as hard as he could, calling out to his friend. In between the continued heaves, Rob heard Vincent pleading weakly, Help! Me! Rob started slamming himself against the door, trying to break it down. It wouldn't budge. He tried the doorknob again not expecting it to make a difference, but somehow it was now unlocked. Rushing in, he found Vincent sitting on the floor in the attached bathroom, throwing up violently. The bathroom was covered in sick, mixed with blood and something else. Something stringy, that Rob couldn't quite make out. But that wasn't his main concern at the time. Rob helped Vincent to the shower, where he washed him down. Even as his friend continued throwing up, the rest of the group soon came rushing up after hearing the commotion. Liz grabbed some towels 
and Sheila fetched the paracetamol she had packed just in case, while Mike brought up a couple of bottles of mineral water. And as Vincent's condition slowly started to stabilize, Ashok helped to clean up the mess in the bathroom. The whole incident felt like forever. It had only been a few minutes. By half past midnight, Vincent was fast asleep in bed. Exhausted from the ordeal, the rest of the group hesitantly agreed that they would discuss what had happened in the morning. Rob didn't sleep in his own room that night, instead opting to crash on the floor of Vincent's room, just in case. The following morning, Vincent awoke with a mild headache, nothing worse than a slight hangover. When his friends asked him what he could recall from the night before, he said that he couldn't remember anything beyond staying outside when everyone else went in. We didn't really get into the details with him, Rob says. We figured there was no need to freak him out, and, well, I know it sounds stupid, but we all tried to reason it away. Everyone just assumed that the luncheon meat had gone bad, Liz says, even though it definitely wouldn't account for the state in which we'd found Vince the night before. Still, we hoped that that would be the end of it, Ashok says, then sighs and continues. But on some level, I think we all knew that this was just the beginning. Rob, an Australian living and working in Singapore, has just finished telling me part of a story over drinks at a coffee shop in Ubi. Him, his college roommate Ashok, and Ashok's wife Liz are my last three interviewees on this busy Hungry Ghost Month evening. The trio had all experienced disturbing encounters during a trip to Port Dixon back in 2015, together with their three friends, Vincent, and another couple, Sheila and Mike. None of them had noticed at the time, however, that their holiday had fallen during the last weekend of the Hungry Ghost Month. Rob's just told me about how Vincent had fallen violently ill on the first night at their Port Dixon villa throwing up vomit, blood, and some stringy substance. After cleaning up the mess and putting their friend to bed, the group had decided to brush it off as just a strange one-off incident. But on some level, says Ashok, I think we all knew that this was just a start. I shift my seat and my recorder slightly to face him now. Ashok says that despite what had happened to Vincent the night before, the group decided the best thing to do was to go ahead with their scheduled plans on the second day of their trip. Go-karting, he says with only a slight chuckle. That's what we got up to. After Vince's mysteriously quick recovery, he sighs regretfully, then continues. If only we had just packed up and left that morning instead. He stares blankly into the distance as Rob grips his shoulder supportively. I notice then that Liz, her hand in Ashok's, has the same faraway look. I give them a moment to collect themselves then ask Ashok to start. 
from his beginning. After an afternoon of go-karting, the group stopped by a cafe to grab some sandwiches and finger food for dinner. Just like when they arrived on the first evening of their holiday, returning to the villa on that second day gave them an uneasy feeling. All the surrounding villas remained unoccupied, and even the late afternoon's enchanting glow couldn't make up for the foreboding sense of dread that their accommodation inspired. After they parked the minivan in the driveway, everyone headed up to their own rooms to freshen up before their early dinner. Ashok changed out of his t-shirt and jeans into a singlet and shorts. Liz wanted to take a shower, but very quickly had a change of heart. From the moment I stepped into the ensuite bathroom, I felt like I was being watched. She explains, shuddering. Normally, I would have brushed it off, Ashok says, rubbing her arms soothingly. Paranoia? After the night before, maybe? Except, I could feel it too. A presence, just beyond the bathroom door. Without soaping up, Liz hurried out of the bathroom, dripping wet. In that moment, the couple looked at each other and just knew. After she had dried off and changed, Liz and Ashok headed downstairs. On their way down, however, they passed by Sheila and Mike's room and noticed that the door was slightly ajar. Still reeling from the eeriness that they had just experienced, Ashok immediately felt like something was wrong. Liz and him paused to knock on the door. Sheila had just finished a quick shower, Ashok says, but Mike had apparently already gone downstairs without a word. Ashok and Liz waited for Sheila to get ready before heading down together. They didn't mention anything about the presence they felt in their room. No sense freaking everyone out, they reasoned, if there was nothing more than a feeling to go on, albeit a strong one. As the three friends neared the bottom of the stairs, Ashok, Liz and Sheila nearly tripped and fell from shock. At the foot of the stairs was a pillar. Standing in its shadow was Mike, staring menacingly at them. Sayang, what the hell? Sheila shouted at him. No response. Just an angry gaze. Ashok's frustrations bubbling to the surface. He chastised Mike furiously. But Mike silenced him with a guttural snarl. And that's when he turned his attention to Liz. Silently, Mike raised his arms and pointed right at her. His snarl turned into an evil grin. Without thinking, Ashok leapt forward and grabbed Mike's arm, but Mike pulled free and just turned to walk away, out the villa's front door. Ashok wanted to go after him, but Liz stopped him. I didn't know what Mike was capable of at that moment, Liz says. 
Soon, Vincent and Rob joined them. And after Ashok had told them what had happened, Rob insisted that they go out to look for Mike. Vince was out there all alone the night before, when the illness struck him, Rob says. I didn't want to risk anything happening to anyone else. Ashok was still hesitant, more for Liz's safety than anything else. But just as they had all agreed to head out, however, Mike walked back in, looking none the worse for wear. He talked about the sunset and how beautiful it was out there, like nothing had happened, Ashok tells me, shaking his head. Ashok, Liz and Sheila tried to question him, to ask him about what had happened earlier, but Mike genuinely seemed to have no recollection. As far as he was concerned, he just took a stroll outside to enjoy the view while Sheila was taking a shower. Mike brushed off any further questions, and eventually the group settled down for dinner. We still tried to hold on to this dying hope that things weren't as bad as they seemed, Ashok says. But there was no fooling ourselves this time. Everyone ate silently, the gravity of the situation finally dawning on all of them. When he was done, Mike wanted to head up to sleep, but Sheila awkwardly said she would rather spend the night in Ashok and Liz's room. Sheila seemed to be bracing herself, waiting for that twisted version of her husband to return. Ashok had tensed up too, prepared to leap in front of Sheila if Mike showed any signs of aggression. Instead, Mike just looked confused, then shrugged and said that he'd keep the door unlocked if she changed her mind. Rob and Vincent headed up next, each to their own rooms. And eventually, Ashok, Liz and Sheila retreated to the couple's room. They talked for a while, trying to reason out Mike's earlier behavior at first. A dumb prank, work stress finally getting to him, maybe even just a weird mood. No matter what logical explanation they came up with though, it just didn't feel right. They decided that they would leave the following morning, two days earlier than planned. They had hoped that the other three would go along with this, but even if they didn't, they'd just call for a car to pick them up. Finally, settling on their plans, the three friends felt somewhat comfortable enough to get some rest. Liz and Sheila would take the bed, with Ashok laying out a spare mattress on the floor. Before climbing into bed, however, Liz thought it might do them some good to open the balcony doors. I wanted to just let some air into what was starting to feel like a very claustrophobic place, Liz says, with a heavy sigh. As she grabbed the door knob though, she jumped back in terror and screamed. She frantically called out to Ashok. She scrambled towards him. Ashok ran to her and asked what was wrong, but she could only point shakily towards the balcony. Cautiously, he inched towards the doors, then reached out for the knob. What he felt wasn't ornately carved metal, but hair, long, coarse, black hair, wrapped around the doorknob, forming an almost cocoon-like shape. 
Ashok recoiled in disgust. But a moment later, a realization struck him. The hair. That's what the stringy substance in Vince's vomit was the night before. We wanted to get out right there and then, Ashok tells me. But it was already dark and we'd all had a full day. Ashok, Liz and Sheila remained huddled together on the bed the rest of the night. None of them had a wink of sleep, but thankfully, nothing happened to them. Nothing, that is, beyond the sense that they were all being watched. The following morning, Ashok explained to the rest of the group why they needed to leave. Much to his relief, everyone agreed. We packed our things as quickly as we could, hopped into the minivan and sped off, Ashok says, his voice shaking slightly. We didn't look back. Hell, we didn't even look out the windows. The last thing we wanted to see were all those other unoccupied villas. He hesitates on the word unoccupied, and I can understand why. Everyone's silent for a second, and I wonder whether that's the end of the ordeal. But then, almost as if she senses my uncertainty, Liz speaks up. What we didn't realize then, she says, was that something followed us home. It's getting late on this chilly, hungry ghost month evening. My last interviewee is tonight, Liz, her husband Ashok, and their friend Rob have been sharing stories of strange encounters while on holiday in Port Dixon. When Ashok told me about how their vacation had abruptly come to an end, I naturally assumed that their stories would as well. After a short pause, however, Liz said, what we didn't realize then was that something followed us home. I naturally shift my attention to her now and ask when exactly she knew that they were being followed. She says that she had felt uneasy throughout the entire drive back to Singapore, but initially chalked it up to their experiences over the past two days. I think it was only when we hit Johor that I finally realized that it was something else. Liz reminds me that she had felt like she was being watched the afternoon before in their holiday villa. As they got closer and closer to Singapore, that same feeling returned, only stronger and stronger. I was hoping that as soon as we crossed the causeway, things would go back to normal and I could leave it all behind, she says. She inhales deeply, bracing herself, I assume, to tell this part of the story. As she exhales, I tell her to take her time and when she's ready, she can start from her beginning. When Liz and Ashok returned to their flat in Sigla that evening, it seemed like the presence had finally decided to leave Liz alone. She also acknowledges, however, that maybe being back in their own home brought some sense of comfort too. And honestly, I think we were just too exhausted to give it the attention 
is clearly craving, she adds, with a slight chuckle. Whatever the reason for her respite, the couple was calm enough to head to bed relatively early that night. At around six the following morning, though, Liz was awoken by aches all over her body. Struggling out of bed and into their bathroom, she switched on the lights to find bruises covering her arms, legs, and shoulders. She tried to call out to Ashok, but her yell was suddenly cut short. Only a terrified gasp escaped her lips. In her peripheral vision, Liz saw what looked like a child standing in the corner of her bathroom. She spun around in a panic, but couldn't get a clear look at the child. Finally, she dashed out of the bathroom to wake her husband. Although he was shocked by her contusions, Ashok still tried to comfort her, assuring her that nothing had followed them back. He told me that this was probably my body's way of struggling with the stress that we had all gone through, she says. She adds that while she understood what he was trying to do, she knew, even then, that this was more than that. Still, after about an hour, she managed to regain her composure a little. Since their holiday had ended earlier, she had two more vacation days left. She decided that this day was as good a time as any to run some errands she had been putting off. And after everything that happened within the walls of that villa in Port Dixon, she says, the last thing I wanted was to spend another second indoors. So, Liz put on a brave face, went about the rest of her day as best as she could. Wherever she went, though, the presence seemed to follow her. Sometimes it was nothing more than a prickling sensation on the back of her neck. Sometimes it felt like she was being watched from afar. And sometimes, sometimes she could have sworn she saw that child again, always just out of her line of sight. That night, Liz told Ashok about her day. Together, they decided that they'd figure out how to deal with it in the morning. But once again, at six the following morning, Liz was awoken by aches. Instead of heading to the bathroom alone, though, this time, she woke Ashok up too. Bleary-eyed, Ashok rolled over in bed, then yelled out in fright. Behind Liz, but just out of the corner of his eye, he saw the child. And he managed to get a better look at the figure, Liz tells me, her voice getting a little quieter. It was just a little girl. While the shock of it initially frightened Ashok, what he was left with, however, was an aura of sadness emanating from the ghostly child. The couple quickly headed out to their neighborhood coffee shop. There, they weighed out their options of what they could do, before finally deciding to give one of Liz's friends a call. And that friend knew a... well, he called him a master that we could speak to, Liz explains. 
they headed to a temple that very afternoon. But the master greeted them at the gate. You are welcome here. He had said warmly to Liz and Ashok, and turned to a seemingly empty space behind them, and added in a neutral tone, But you must wait outside. Inside the temple, the couple recounted to the master what had happened, from the incidents in Port Dixon right up to the encounters of the last two days. The master only nodded and listened intently. When they were done, he closed his eyes and remained in a quiet, almost meditative state for about half a minute. As the master slowly opened his eyes again, he revealed that the girl was just one of many spirits that dwelt within the villa. The master told them that almost all of those other spirits wanted to harm the couple and their friends. The girl, however, had protected them. And their friend Vince had violently thrown up it was because one of the spirits had tried to possess him. The girl pulled the malevolent presence out before it could do any further harm. The hair wrapped around Liz and Ashok's room's doorknob. There was another spirit's way of marking them for its own. But the girl stood in its way. And as they sped off, the girl prevented the other spirits from latching onto them before she followed them herself. It's in that moment that I realize Liz was embracing herself because the story was horrifying. She was bracing herself because it was heartbreaking. It turns out, despite everything that happened, we were really lucky, Liz says with a smile on her face, even as her voice begins to crack slightly. The bruises and aches that Liz had received were the only way the little girl knew how to get her attention. She wanted us to bring her to Singapore, to get her out of that place and away from those other malicious entities, and finally, to a master, Liz says. The master promised Liz and Ashok that he would do what he can to help the little girl reincarnate. He said that since they were still within the Hungry Ghost Month at that time, it might have been easier for the girl to at long last Find peace. Nothing else out of the ordinary happened after that, Liz tells me. If anything, that night I had the most restful sleep I've had in the longest time. I ask if she knows what happened to the girl, and she tells me she isn't certain. But a few days later, she dreamt of her, standing in the corner of their room. I wasn't afraid though, Liz says. But more importantly, neither was she. Not anymore. The three friends finish their drinks and get up to leave. I thank them for their time. But before I head off myself, I pause for a moment. To just take in this chilly, hungry ghost month evening one more time. The smell of burnt offerings still fills the air, long after observers had reverently fed hell notes into flames. I think about how busy 
I am during this month, and find myself smiling, oddly enough. Yeah, it's great that I'm able to add more stories to my collection. For the more benevolent spirits, like that little girl, it's nice to know that this month offers them a better chance for their stories to be told. Everything I'm about to tell you is based on hearsay, says Christian in a conspiratorial whisper. Christian is a train driver. It's a job he's done for 15 years, and he's done it well. But he admits it can get monotonous. Believe me, I'm not complaining, he tells me, as he takes a seat at the Sime coffee shop. Everything's thoroughly checked out. Everyone's safety is pretty much a given. But you know how this is, lah. When it's all running smoothly, people will look elsewhere for excitement. In most jobs, this means office gossip. For Christian and his colleagues, this takes the form of an unusual sighting. Which is why I needed to add the disclaimer. He explains. This is about as close to office gossip as we'll get for us train drivers. This story has been pieced together by a few of Christian's colleagues. He can't entirely vouch for it, but he's heard of me and what I do. And he thought that I might be interested in it. I tell him that I certainly am as I take out my recorder and ask him to start from the beginning. It was 3 a.m. on a Thursday morning in 2013, and Christian's fellow train driver, Walter, had just arrived at work. Walter was set to drive the sweep train that day. Sweep trains go through the whole line to make sure that there aren't any materials or equipment left on the track. Christian explains. Most of the time, these sweeps turned up nothing of concern. This Thursday morning was different, though. The way Walter told it to Christian, he wasn't surprised that he was being radioed by Ellen from the operations control centre. Ops control sometimes would ask the drivers to double check something that they might have seen on their cameras. It's all this well oiled machine, Christian says. The drivers and Ops control and everyone else look out for each other. What did surprise Walter, however, was the hesitation in Ellen's voice. Christian says that they all know Ellen. She's usually very sure and confident. Normally, when she asks one of the drivers or the station staff to take a look at something, it's just to confirm that there's nothing wrong more than anything else. This time, however, something was definitely wrong. Walter, there's there's someone at the point machine, she said. A point machine, Christian tells me, is basically the machine that controls the track direction. Like everywhere else on the tracks, when there's a train running, there shouldn't have been anyone at the point machine. But that's what Ellen saw on her monitor. Clear as day, a construction worker standing at the point machine, staring directly at the camera itself. The construction worker, as Ellen told Christian, looked sad. But there was a blankness in his eyes, an emptiness that Ellen had never seen in anyone. 
not anyone alive anyway. For some reason, at that very moment, Alan thought of bodies in caskets. Bodies that no matter how well made up or dressed, were without a doubt devoid of life. Not taking her attention of the monitor, Alan first radioed the station staff to take a look. After all, the point machine was within the border of the station. Alan made the mistake, however, of telling them what she had seen. No one wanted to check it out, Christian says, then adds with a smirk, understandably. So instead, she radioed Walter. When she had told him what she had seen, there was a pause before Walter's response. Walter, Christian says, was one of those guys who kept his head down and did what he was told. Which is why his hesitance cemented her own fears. Finally, however, after what felt like ages, Walter agreed to alight the train and head over to the point machine. It was about 4.30am when Walter reached the location. He was filled with relief when he found nothing and no one was there. He radioed back to Ellen to ask if she still saw anyone else there. She hesitated again. Later, Ellen would tell Christian that she didn't take her eyes off the monitor, not for a second. She barely even blinked. But the moment the cameras picked up Walter, the mysterious construction worker vanished. Right before her eyes. Alan told Walter as much. Her voice shaking so badly now that it washed away all of that relief he had felt and replaced it with sadness. Walter told Ellen that he'd look around for a bit, but every fiber of his being just wanted to leave, Christian tells me. As he continued to inspect the area, however, that sadness grew stronger. It drove Walter first to tears. The longer he stayed there, though, he could feel his grip on sanity begin to slip. And the sadness warped into paranoia. Panic. Claustrophobia. Soon, Walter was so overwhelmed by that sense of dread that he didn't just want to leave, he needed to. Maintaining his composure as best as he could, Walter very quickly made his way out of that area. Walter, who was always the first to volunteer, who never shirked his duty, asked someone else to retrieve the sweep train that day. Christian finishes up his story and exhales a breath he hadn't realized he was holding in. He asks me what I think. I tell him what he told me at the start, that it sounds like a very interesting story, but it's hearsay. Still, he sworn me to secrecy, so I can't get on record where exactly this happened. But from what I know about the area and its history, his story certainly seems plausible. 
And as I tell him this, his expression darkens. He lets out another breath and turns away from me. I was hoping their story would have been enough, he says softly. But I guess hearsay just won't cut it. Christian tells me that a year after what happened to Walter and Ellen, he was driving a train through that area. Truth be told, he had all but forgotten about that incident. Walter and Ellen certainly didn't want to talk about it. Both of their reputations had taken a hit. Not a massive hit, mind you, Christian says. Just enough that every once in a while, they'd see their colleagues giving them weird looks. Christian then adds, quietly, myself included. While driving this train, however, he was suddenly, inexplicably, struck by a sense of sadness. Thankfully, he was so focused on driving the train that even though the sadness grew more and more, he was still able to fend it off. As he pulled into the station, however, he saw it. Just briefly. So briefly, in fact, that he doubted it for just a second. But he knew what he saw. Reflected in the window of the train was a construction worker. Standing right behind him. Staring at him. With dead eyes. Christian goes silent. I don't say anything either. I don't have to. That look on his face. This wasn't just a story or hearsay. This was very real for Christian. Young men. Can I get anything for you? Asks Augustine, cheerily standing up as I arrive at his neighborhood coffee shop in Clementi. I tell him that it's okay and I'll call over the drink stall auntie in a bit. He seems hurt for just a moment and I think I know why. I explain to the 75-year-old gentleman that it's not that I don't think he's capable. I just want to get settled down first before I order my copy. He responds, not with skepticism or defensiveness as I had expected, but with a hearty laugh and a pat on my back. My boy, don't worry. I'm not sensitive about my age he says reassuringly it's just that i've been in the hotel industry my whole life all habits despite my best intentions die hard augustine tells me proudly how since his 20s he's worked as everything from a cleaner all the way up to a general manager he built a career that helped support his family So, you can imagine how strange it felt to retire, he says. He has since learned to enjoy his golden years, though he does look back fondly on his time in hospitality. Which is why he was so eager to meet with me. Everyone wants to know about celebrities or politicians I've met. But very few people ask about 
ghost stories he says excitedly this is obviously my cue to fish out my recorder so i make sure to wave the drink stall auntie over before i ask augustine to start from the beginning In 1986, Augustine was working as a night shift front desk clerk in a Changi village hotel. Back then, that neighborhood was, uh, how do I put this, pretty uh, colorful, he tells me with a smirk. Still, the drunks and good time Charlies never gave me any trouble, or at least more trouble than I could handle. It certainly helped that the hotel's staff were friendly and capable. This was Augustine's first job as a clerk, and his more experienced colleagues quickly made sure he knew that he was supported. I don't think I could have wrapped my head around all the admin work if not for them. He confesses. There was one piece of advice, however, that they had offered him early during his time there that didn't make sense to him. Well, not at first, anyway. They told me to stay clear of one particular room, he says. When he asked them why, though, his colleagues would just brush him off. The closest he ever got to an actual answer was something Jaya, one of the older front desk clerks, had told him. We all know that a lot of this area is uh, dirty. There are some places, though they are dirtier than others. Augustine certainly wasn't a complete non-believer in the supernatural. Of course, I had heard some truly frightening accounts. We all grew up in the kampong. Who hadn't heard a ghost story or two? He says. But that's all they were to him. Stories told by friends of friends. Still, out of respect to his co-workers, Augustine tried his best to never put a guest in that room until one particular night. The hotel hadn't seen business like this in a while. Even when Augustine took into account that it was the mid-year holidays, they were pretty much fully booked for the next month or so and had to turn away a number of guests every day. Which wasn't a problem for me by this point, Augustine says. He had learned over the last six months how to speak to guests, to placate the difficult ones, to make himself memorable to the generous ones, to be invaluable to the ones who demanded discretion, and to be ever-present to the ones with families. But there was one guest that he just couldn't turn away. A young woman named Natalie had flown in from Malacca because her mother had passed on. She had no relatives here, or at least none that would speak to her. And she needed a place to stay. All the other hotels she tried were fully booked too, and this was the last place left to try. Augustine couldn't help but feel sympathetic to her plight. After all, I had grown estranged from my own family over the last couple of years too, he says, his tone growing a touch more melancholic. When it was my mother's time though, I knew I wanted to be there. 
the only room available was the one that everyone had warned him about. He thought about how he'd feel in that scenario. If he was desperate to be at his mother's funeral and some hotel clock wouldn't let him stay in their establishment only because the final room available was particularly dirty. Augustine passed her the key to the room and tried to get one of the bellboys' attention. However, they were either busy or, oddly enough, seemed to not even notice him. So, he escorted her up by himself. Augustine remembers the smell of the carpets that lined the hotel's corridors. They always smelled aged, he says, his nose even now wrinkling at the thought of it. Even the newer carpets, aged but mixed with the strong, sharp scent of cleaning liquids. However, the carpet on the eighth floor, where the dirtier room was, reeked of something else as well. Earth. It made me feel like something ancient dwelt on that floor, he says. On this night, as he guided Natalie to her room, that stench was stronger than ever before. The woman didn't seem to notice. Too much on her mind, Augustine reasoned. But he certainly did. And he definitely noticed the faint sound of growls and groans as they got closer to the room. Like a cross between a dying man and a ravenous beast. As they arrived at the door of the room, there was no doubt that the noise was coming from within. Every fiber of Augustine's being told him to run. He turned to Natalie. She was still lost in her thoughts. I hoped that if she heard it too, then I had enough of a reason to get out of there, he says. But looking at her reminded him why he had let her here in the first place. She had nowhere else to go. I reasoned that it was my imagination, that all my colleagues' warnings were playing tricks on my mind, he tells me. Her problems, though, they were real. Augustine turned the knob and flung the door open. The sound stopped, and for a brief moment, he felt relief. It really was just all in his head. But then the sound returned. A growl and a groan, louder than ever. What was that? Natalie gasped. Augustine turned to her, just in time to catch her reaction change from confusion to terror. Augustine followed her line of sight back to the door. And from within the unlit room, something moved towards them. Even in the darkness, they could see it. 
Its face looked human, but indescribably hideous, covered in warts, welts, and pus. Some of its flesh was peeling off, and when it grinned at them, it bared gnarled, sickly yellow teeth. That wasn't the first thing that struck Augustine and Natalie, though. What caught their attention immediately was that it was very, very tall. It was crouching down to fit in the room, and even then, it somehow seemed like it was far larger than the space it occupied. It let out that growl and groan again, but this time, it sounded maliciously playful. The creature was laughing. And that was when both Augustine and Natalie blacked out. When Augustine came to, he was in the staff break room, surrounded by his colleagues. Natalie, however, was nowhere to be seen. He kept asking about the guest he was with, but the only responses he received were blank, worried stares. But the longer he waited for an answer, the more frantic he grew. Finally, Jaya stepped forward, gripped Augustine by the shoulders, and told him sternly, there was no guest. I reviewed the CCTV footage of the night before I left that morning, and they were right. Augustine says thoughtfully. Augustine seemingly just walked up to the eighth floor all of a sudden and stopped in front of that room all by himself. After he reached the room though, the CCTV suddenly went dark for about 20 seconds. When it came back on, Augustine was on the ground. A minute later, one of the bellboys found him and quickly alerted front desk. I told Jaya the whole story about the creature and about Natalie, Augustine says. He looked at me seriously and told me that I needed to see a, a specialist immediately. Don't go home, he said. Don't waste any more time. Despite being prayed over and blessed by the specialist, though, Augustine still fell ill and remained mostly bedridden for a week. When he finally returned to work, Jaya explained to him what had happened. The girl you saw, Jaya said, she died in this hotel last year. The girl was visiting town for her mother's funeral, but she had a heart attack in her room. On the ninth floor, directly above that room. Augustine was more confused than ever now, but Jaya continued. I told you already, some places are dirtier than others. What you saw in the room on the eighth floor, it feeds on people, both living and did. The creature 
Augustine reasons, must have lured both him and Natalie's spirit to the room somehow. I was lucky, I guess, he says mournfully. I suppose whatever that thing did, it has a far greater effect on spirits than it does on the living. We both sit silently for a moment before he shakes off the pall that's threatened to descend upon us. He notices that I'm almost done with my copy and gets up to head to the drink store. Don't worry, he tells me, his tone cheery again. My next two stories don't end quite as sadly. Singh takes a drag off his cigarette before he starts telling me about another incident. It's the second story he's relating to me tonight. It's also, thankfully, the last story I'll be recording on this Hungry Ghost Month evening. I've been seeing apparitions. I initially thought it might have been stress or a lack of rest that was getting to me. But you see, Seng has the third eye, and there's no mistaking how badly his hands shaking as he exhales a trail of smoke. So, with as level a tone as I can manage, I ask Seng to start from the beginning of his second story. It was 2010. At the time, Buntat Street was home to an incredibly popular bar. Every Friday and Saturday night, the place would be packed from wall to wall. Patrons would dance and flirt, drink to forget or to create new memories, and even, every once in a while, start a fight. That, of course, was where Singh came in. I work security there, he says, waving his cigarette animatedly as he speaks, the smoke swirling all around him. The establishment, Singh tells me, occupied three floors of an old shop house. The main area on the ground floor, a members only area on the second level, and the office on the third. Seng was still very much a night owl then, so the bar made perfect sense as his next career move. He thought its loud crowds and even louder music would be a welcome change, especially after the deafening silence of working the night shift in a haunted condo. What he didn't take into account, however, was that the crowds would always eventually leave and the music would stop. And what waited for him in the silence of the bar might just be as bad or worse than what he faced in the condo. It was a Saturday night during that year's Hungry Ghost Month. Well, closer to Sunday morning really. The bar had closed and its patrons had cleared out by 3.30 a.m. Now, at 4.30, the only people left were Seng, a 20-something bartender named Martin, and the owner, a woman in her late 40s named Sandy. The three were gathered in the office on the third floor, celebrating with several rounds of drinks. It was not unusual for Sandy and a few of her staff members to enjoy a beer or two after a particularly busy night. 
But this night was probably the busiest the bar had ever seen. Seng recalls breaking up a couple of fights and tossing out at least one handsy guy. Ah yeah, got more lah. But I also cannot remember, he says. Still tense, even as his tone lightens just a little. Nothing brought the mood of the night down for long though, when the bar's patrons were spending like there was no tomorrow. Most of the staff headed back once the bar had closed. But Martin was a night owl too. Which, as it turns out, worked to his advantage. Feeling especially generous that night, Sandy brought out a particularly strong blend of whiskey to celebrate. That's why, despite being a decent enough drinker, Seng found himself stumbling to the officer's washroom after only four glasses. Seng went about his business rather shakily, thankfully not making a mess. As he stepped back out of the cubicle though, someone brushed past behind him and into the cubicle beside his. Martin, he assumed. Seng jokingly yelled out that the younger man shouldn't be so rude to his elders, then started washing his hands. He stared at his reflection the whole time, trying to decide if he was actually physically swaying or if the booze had caused his vision to blur. Whatever the reason, Seng decided that splashing his face with water would certainly help. As he looked up from the sink though, he saw what he thought was Martin exit the cubicle behind him. It was then that Singh realized that whatever was behind him clearly wasn't human. Squinting through the water on his face, Singh now saw that the thing moved slowly, strangely like a beast-like person. It was still shrouded in shadows, somehow just outside of the reach of the washroom's fluorescent lights. Singh wanted to run, but he had enough experience with things from beyond the veil of the ordinary. It was toying with him, and if he ran, it would only just attack him. So, he waited, until after what felt like hours, but was probably no more than a few seconds, the creature stepped into the light. All Singh remembers was its face. It was terrifying, beyond words. It's flesh warped, its hair a tangled mess that seemed to move all on its own. A twisted mockery of a woman's face. A demon. Sang ran, stumbling out of the washroom. In barely concealed panic, he told Sandy and Martin that they needed to go home immediately. Seeing the look on his face, the bartender and the owner did not argue. Without cleaning up or even switching off the lights, the three of them left the building. A building that suddenly felt a whole lot older than it ever had before. Later that night, just as he reached home, Singh received a text from Sandy. You saw Tatia, is it? The text read. Singh didn't know who this Tatia or 
Big Sister was. Sandy offered to explain it to him later that Sunday afternoon, while the sun was still up. Tatye, as the demon was nicknamed by Sandy, was a creature that had haunted the bar ever since they moved in. Some of the staff members with a third eye had claimed to see a strange version of a woman lurking in darker corners. Tatye hadn't harmed anyone before, let alone been this upfront about its existence. Sandy told Singh that she thinks Tatye was angry. The offerings that Sandy had burned for previous hungry ghost months might have sufficed before. But as her business grew, the entity that lurked in her establishment demanded more too. When Sandy arrived at the bar that Sunday afternoon, she carried with her paper effigies of beautiful dresses, shoes, playing cards, and makeup. She also had enough food for a whole family. Together with Martin and Singh, Sandy headed out to the alley behind the bar. There, they burned the offerings, laid out the food, and lit joysticks, all while apologizing for not giving Tatye what it was due. For the rest of that hungry ghost month, not only were the staff and patrons left alone, but the bar earned even more than before. No matter how busy it got though, Sandy never stayed after hours to drink with her staff again. Just to be safe, Singh decided that he was done with night shift work. He quit on the very last day of that year's Hungry Ghost Month. Singh stubs out his fifth cigarette for the night and shoots me a look. I ask him how many apparitions he sees around me. A lot, he says simply, trying to keep his attention on me and not look directly at the spirits that are apparently following me around. I thank him, then take my leave for that night. As I walk away, I look back and see that Singh seems relieved. Lost in his thoughts, Brian looks around this quiet neighborhood, just a little off Jalan Pulikat, as he absently sips on his coffee. He's been this way since just after he arrived and greeted me. It's weird, he says, more to himself than to me. So much has changed, but so much is still the same. Brian moved to Sydney over a decade ago to further his studies. Once he was done with university, he started to build a life for himself there, driven more by momentum than by any affection for the city he had grown to call home. These days, he's a junior partner in a reputable law firm and happy in a committed relationship. Aside from regular Skype calls with his parents, he hasn't thought much about Singapore since leaving, let alone this neighborhood. But so much of my family is tied into this area, he says, a hint of wistfulness coloring his tone. 
his father and mother were neighbors back during those halcyon kampung days. And that's how they met. In fact, their homes were just a short walk away from here, along Charlton Road. I can't imagine what it must have been like for them to see how much this whole area has changed, he continues. He goes silent for a while before his attention finally snaps back to me. He apologizes for spacing out, and I tell him with a reassuring chuckle that it's fine. He tells me that he's not the sentimental type, or at least he didn't think he was. I guess this place is more of a pull on me than I thought, he says. As the sun begins to set on this Thursday evening, I see what he means. It might just be my imagination, but I sense something. I'm not sure what it is, or even if it's tied to this area specifically, but just as quickly as it came over me, the sensation's gone again. I shake my head slightly. As word gets around about me, I've begun to take on more interviewees than I used to. One of my previous interviewees, Neil, is friends with Brian. The pair were catching up a week ago, since Brian's back in town for his sister's wedding. Neil had heard this particular story before. A tale of Brian's father from back in the old days and told him about me and what I do. Not only did he convince Brian that we should meet up, but he even suggested that we specifically met here. Neil told him with a laugh that it might help set the mood. I don't think Neil realizes just how right he was. I make a mental note to take a short break after this interview, then fish out my recorder. I switch it on before Brian can get lost in his thoughts again and ask him to start from the beginning. It was 1967. Brian's father, Andrew, was a bit of a flirt back when he was a teenager. This was before he'd met mum, of course, Brian says with a smirk. He then adds, rolling his eyes, from what he's told me, the old man used to get into way too many fights because of his flirtatious ways. Overprotective brothers, jealous boyfriends, even strict fathers. He had earned a reputation among all of them. It was after one such fight at a nightclub in town when he found himself skulking home. According to Andrew, this was one of those rare instances where he really was just chatting with a girl around his age. Then, her boyfriend and his friends stepped in. Outnumbered, Andrew was unceremoniously tossed out of the club. About an hour later, he was passing by the old crocodile farm along Upper Sarangoon Road, navigating the tree-lined paths that led him back to Charlton Road. Brian shivers a little, thinking about that area. Even when I used to walk through there as a kid, 
It was still pretty creepy at night, Brian says. I nod in agreement, having traveled through that stretch before. Andrew, however, would have disagreed. While it might have been ominously gloomy, with little more than the moonlight to illuminate his way, Andrew had told Brian that his walks home never frightened him. He claims that he always found it weirdly soothing, Brian says, then shrugs. How much of that is true and how much of it is just him trying to appear tough for his son, I'm not sure. Either way, Andrew was used to the quiet of this trek, almost never encountering anyone along the way. Except on this one night. As he neared Charlton, he caught a whiff of something sweet, like the familiar fragrance of a flower. Before he could figure out where it came from though, that smell grew from a lingering scent to something far more overpowering, something so sickeningly sweet that he felt like it was choking him. But just as suddenly as the fragrance appeared, it vanished, replaced instead by a creeping stench of rotting flesh. It wasn't as strong as the sweetness that preceded it, but it was pungent enough to drive the birds in the trees into a frenzy. Or at least that's what he thought at first. The birds squawking grew louder and louder. It wasn't panic that Andrew was hearing. It soon dawned on him. It was aggression. Their squawking quickly seemed to almost melt into one piercing noise. Andrew had never heard any bird that sounded like that. He glanced upwards towards the noise and saw a large shadow move through the leaves of the trees. Its branches shook for a little, before becoming eerily still. In that moment, Andrew's eyes were drawn down to the tree's base, where he suddenly realized there was a girl standing and smiling at him. She wore a flowing, plain white dress and was surrounded by overgrown grass. She was pale, with long, black hair. The girl looked around his age. Apakaba, she greeted him. Her tone was warm and even had a friendly sing-song quality to it. Andrew should have been terrified, but he wasn't. He knew what she was, Brian tells me. But it was like he was under some kind of spell. He greeted the girl pleasantly, slurring a little, almost as if he was half asleep. 
Temankan saya balik. The gull said, Walk me home. It wasn't a request. It was a command. Andrew agreed, then asked her where she lived. Dekat Jaltan, she said, her smile widening. After a minute or so of casually strolling along, the girl asked Andrew whether he found her pretty. (sighs) Very, Andrew said. It was the truth, not a line that he would have normally used on another woman or even a lie tainted by fear. Andrew was surprised by his own honesty, like some kind of weight had been lifted off his shoulders. The girl told him that he was a charming boy, but he must be kind with that charm. Macam aku, she said, with an unsettlingly knowing smirk. Like me. It was strange hearing her call him a boy when she looked like she was a teenager too. She said that she had been watching him. His pulse began to quicken, even as her spell kept him weirdly calm. She said that she knew what was in his heart, that he had a good heart. She told him her tone still warm with that sing-song quality to it, that her kind did not just kill. They killed those who deserved it. Then, she said, with haunting finality, Akuhara Kita tak berjumpa lagi. I hope we never meet again. Andrew suddenly saw where he was. Right in front of his home. The girl kept on down the path into the darkness of the night. That sickeningly sweet scent from before faintly in the air. As Andrew watched her leave, though, he finally noticed something. She had no feet below her plain white dress. My father cleaned up his act after that night, Brian tells me. No more treating women like notches on a bedpost. Two months later, Brian's mother moved into the home right next to Andrew's. Dad always tells me that that encounter was probably the best thing to ever happen to him. That sometimes we need something drastic to remind us who we really are. He says that he doesn't think Andrew would have been ready for his mother if not for what happened. I smile as Brian gets that faraway look on his face again. This place really does have a special meaning to their family. It, I pause as I look around the neighborhood, 
and from behind one of the blocks, off in the direction where I would walk if I wanted to head towards Charlton. I see, or I think I see, a figure in white. I shake my head and take another look. Nothing. Yeah, I tell myself, it's definitely time to take a short break. Well, maybe. Maybe after the Hungry Ghost Man. Jonathan shifts awkwardly as I place my recorder on the table. Around us are the sights, sounds, and scents of his neighborhood hawker center, an almost uniquely Singaporean eatery. Weekly lit signs illuminate all kinds of people from around the area. Middle-aged men and women yell out orders in a variety of languages, shouting over the tinkling of metal teaspoons against glass cups and the scuffing of utensils against the walks, almost as old as the hawker centre itself. The smell of prata, noodles, rice and so many other types of oily food waft through the air, mixed with the fumes of passing cars. Normally, all of this would bring a certain nostalgic comfort to any resident of the island city-state. Jonathan, however, continues to fidget, even as he sips from his cup of ginger tea. He looks like he hasn't had a full night's sleep in years. His skin is wrinkly, more so than anyone's in their late forties should be. His eyes dart back and forth, seemingly looking out for some unseen danger that's waiting for the right moment to strike. He'd already look paranoid, even if he wasn't in a country known for its low crime rates. But there's another thing that Singapore is known for, it's ghost stories. I ask Jonathan if he's sure he wants to do this. He nods, hesitantly. He asks if I do this often, collect accounts of the supernatural specific to Southeast Asian countries, cities, and neighborhoods. And I return a nod. He pauses for a moment, then asks why I do this. This time, I respond with silence instead, not wanting to delve too deeply into the details of what I do. He's scared enough as it is already. Instead, I switch the recorder on and ask him to start his story from the beginning. Jonathan grew up in Hauga, in the northeast part of Singapore, and has stayed around the neighborhood for all his life. He tells me that things were different back when he was a kid in the late 70s. He assures me that he's not saying this out of some sense of longing for a rose-tinted past. These days, kids just prefer to stay home and play video games or spend hours going down their social media rabbit holes. But back in the late 70s though, all him and his friends ever wanted to do was play soccer in the fields surrounding the government-built apartment blocks. And with more and more of those blocks going up every day, there was a weird, unspoken sense of inevitability that filled the air, Jonathan tells me. It felt like the world that him and his friends knew was going away. 
no one said anything, of course. They were all still kids then, and these were the kinds of things that they couldn't articulate at the time. Not in words, anyway. Instead, they played soccer like every day was the only day that mattered. Whole afternoons after school were spent running through uncut grass. By day's end, their once pristinely white school shoes would be caked thoroughly with mud, as they spent hours dashing from one end of the field to the other, hoping to score the winning goal between the soda bottles that they'd set up as makeshift goalposts. All around them, the giant blocks, those harbingers of a changing future, loomed over them. But hidden within these blocks, some elements of Singapore's past refused to die. It was a Wednesday afternoon. Jonathan recalls clearly. His voice suddenly focused, his fidgeting dying down. Sivam, his childhood best friend, had kicked the ball a little too hard. He had shot out of the field and rolled into the ground floor common area of one of the neighboring apartment buildings. Jonathan was closest to the building, so he yelled that he'd get it, waving to his other friends as he dashed towards the block. As he reached the common area, however, he realized that he couldn't spot the ball anywhere. He looked around and around until even the field was out of sight. And that's when he heard what sounded like a woman calling out to him in a sing-song tone. Boy. Her voice was a weird mix of motherly and menacing. The sweet comfort of care somehow laced with something far more sinister. Boy. She called out again. Jonathan looked around the common area, but didn't see anyone else. He answered with a hesitant, Hello? Mencari bola kau? The woman said, Are you looking for your ball? Y yes, said Jonathan, still looking around. Suddenly, he heard a ball bouncing against the cold concrete of the apartment block. But it sounded wrong. Almost as if someone had taken the sound and distorted it slightly. He spun around to see the ball bouncing, seemingly by itself a flight of stairs, just a couple of feet away. He ran towards the stairs, just in time to see the ball disappear around a corner at the top of that flight. Marisini, came the woman's voice from around the corner. Come here. From where her voice emanated, an arm slowly appeared. Coffee brown and smooth, the arm seemed to belong to a woman in her twenties. Her nails were manicured and painted blood red. With her long, slim fingers, she gestured Jonathan towards her. He tells me that he knew that he shouldn't go to her that something was clearly not right about this whole situation. But the sing-song tone of her voice compelled him. 
he took a step up. Once more, almost a whisper now, she called out to him. Boy. Her arm seemed to sneak around the corner and down the flight of stairs, too far for any normal person to have stretched. Jonathan tried to turn away. He felt tears well up in his eyes. He tried to protest, tried to fight the pull, but all he could hear was that sing-song call in his head until he felt someone grab him from behind. I've been calling you since just now. You dare for? It was Sivam. Jonathan turned back to the flight of stairs. Nothing except what looked like an old woman's gnarled fingers disappearing around the corner. Jonathan heard that there was a spate of what most people thought were kidnappings around that time. Children disappearing mysteriously. Some rumors claimed that the children's bones were used as the foundations for the then under construction Benjamin Shears Bridge. But Jonathan knows the truth. While other cultures have their bridge trolls, we have this. He starts fidgeting again. They, he tells me, have always been there. And they are not happy with how far we've come from those simpler times. I don't tell him that that's precisely why I do what I do. Why I chart to supernatural by country, by city, and by neighborhood. I'm painting a clearer picture of what's going on in our world and the world beyond the veil of the ordinary. I'm creating my ghost maps. If you want to discover more of Southeast Asia's other side, subscribe now and follow us on social media. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon. Look for We Are Huntu or click the links in the description. Ghost Maps is a Huntu production created by Kyle Ong and Wayne Ray with art direction by Jolene Lim and recorded on Audio-Technica mics. <laughs>